Well, it's great to see uh, all of you um, joining us today. We're excited to have the launch of News on Wiki. Um, this is the second phase of uh, this campaign, uh, of this project, which actually started two years ago. Um, and before I go too far into it, I'm gonna give, um, hand it over to Pete Forsythe. Uh, he and I are the organizers of the 2020 campaign for News on Wiki. So Pete, please take it away. Right, thanks, Sherry. So News on Wiki is a, a campaign that's really organized around the difficulty that people sometimes have in discerning what is or isn't a good news source, especially when they're encountering, some, encountering a news source from across the country, from a community they might not be familiar with, uh, and they can't necessarily tell easily whether it's a, a news publication with a long and respectable history or if it's just some random new thing that was started up last week. So our approach is to improve Wikipedia articles, which has a natural result as demonstrated in research out of Wellesley College. Uh, it has a natural result that it'll show up in Google search results in the knowledge panel. When there's a Wikipedia article, it gets uh, repeated there in Google search results and also in other websites that draw from Wikipedia. Uh, so our colleague, Mike Caulfield came up with this idea and we ran a six month campaign back in uh, 2018, we improved uh, several hundred U.S. newspapers at the time. And uh, we're just getting going on a new six-month campaign that's going to go through February 2021. And this time we're, um, we're taking on three more targeted areas. So the first of these is going to be Washington State. Uh, so as you can see on the map here, we, we focused pretty heavily on Oregon, which is where I live. Uh, in the last round. And so you can see here Oregon next to Washington and you see a lot of green dots. What that indicates is that there is a Wikipedia article and that that Wikipedia article has an info box. So that reflects a lot of the work that we got done in the 2018 round. And now we're hoping to have a similar impact on Washington. So hopefully the Washington map will look a lot more like the Oregon map by the time we're done here. Uh, and I'm gonna hand it back to Sherry to talk about our other two topic areas. Thanks so much, Pete. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a good to, to recognize that this campaign um, at its beginning two years ago um, was expansive to the entire country, to um, throughout the United States. And so what we've done this time around is we are starting to move our sample size smaller so that we can have um, an idea of um, how we can approach coverage um, in different spaces. So for example, um, Pete just spoke about um, a specific state. So so um, taking a look at local newspapers and, and newspaper uh, sources in a, a state. And so um, this, uh, we're also expanding to specific demographic. And so right now we're looking at black owned newspapers. If you take a look at the slide here, you'll see that, um, you know, uh, we're, we're taking a look at the rise of black owned newspapers, especially in the, um, the reconstruction period in the late 1800s, um, 1880, 1890. Um, um, you'll see it look at one of the uh, well known um, uh, writers from the period. Um, and so there's a lot of information to grab there. If we'll take a look at the next slide. Um, we're also going to be taking a look at um, Caribbean focused newspapers. So that is a focus on a specific region. So this time around the region is the Caribbean, um, not just the newspapers on the ground in the Caribbean itself, but also that focus on the um, Caribbean community. Um, if you'll see jutting out from the United States, you'll see an image um, that includes Florida. Florida is a great case in point because there are a lot of newspapers focused on the Caribbean community there. Um, and of course, you've got um, newspapers in the Caribbean itself. Um, all the way up to, to Canada. So um, these are the specific areas that we're looking at this time around. Um, if, if we take a look at the next slide, we are really counting on um, uh, that over the next six to recruit um, participation from various groups like the librarian community and other communities. Um, and we would love for your participation. Join us on our, our mailing list. Um, you can see the, the link right here. And we also have um, uh, ongoing events every Friday throughout the month. So this is a, a case in point. You are uh, at the launch of this uh, six month uh, campaign. 
And um, beyond this, we're going to be trying to have an event every Friday, um, a similar to this kind of a seminar approach. And then, um, uh, you know, it's going to be about four Fridays a month. So it's really a good idea to join our our mailing list to get an idea if you'd like to brush up as we go along or join the campaign continuously. Um, follow us on news at wiki, um, news wiki one on Twitter. There'll be a lot more information pumping out as we go along on there. Our hashtag for today is news on wiki and you can reach us directly at news on wiki at wikistrategies.net. Um, so we look forward to hearing from you, and I hope that you'll enjoy the information um, from our guests today, um, who are going to be focusing on um, uh, librarians in this context. Okay, back to you, Pete. Great. All right. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, so with that, I think uh, let's launch into our guests. Uh, we have two panelists with us today who are both uh, librarians who have worked in the wiki space. So, uh, so these are, are, are both people who have a lot of relevant experience both within and outside the Wikipedia world. Uh, we're really pleased that they're here to help us uh, as, we, as we sort of formulate our approach in this phase of the campaign. So I think we're gonna start with Jessamine West. Uh, Jessamine is based in Vermont. She has a pretty extensive resume which includes the Wikimedia Foundation and the Internet Archive. Uh, she has, I'm going to let you, uh, let you tell us a little bit more about uh, your background, but I'm also interested if you could maybe start off with what got, what was the first thing that got you interested in working on Wikipedia to begin with? Well, um, let me just pull up my slides behind me and uh, there is a uh, link in the chat if you want to follow along uh, like any good librarian. I um, am have assembled a list of links to kind of back up what I talk about, but really what got me going with Wikipedia was I live in a small town in Vermont, and one of the things you find when you Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever your thing is, small towns in Vermont, is you often wind up with a whole bunch of kind of link spammy, like, Braintree, Vermont, buy a gravestone in Braintree, Vermont, like just these random spammer pages that have just gotten a list of all the towns in America. And for towns without a lot of a, for towns without a lot of a Google presence, you wind up with more spam than content. And one of the ways to address that is to make sure those towns, their towns pages are linked on Wikipedia so that people can find information about them. The town information on Wikipedia is useful. And so I basically started a project in, I don't know, 2006, 2007, to make sure if a Vermont town had information about them or a web page that was linked in the external links section of Wikipedia. So that was kind of what got me going. Um, do you want me just to leap in at this point? You're on mute, Pete. Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> I was supposed to be off mute. That was my mistake. No worries. <laughs> Thanks, so, so what got me in was actually a very similar project to this one, a list generating project and a sort of content improvement project so that when you searched Randolph, Vermont, you could learn about the Morgan horse, our claim to fame, and not just a whole bunch of people trying to kind of link spam you uh, online. So as a librarian, somebody with a library background, I just wanted to talk briefly about why Wikipedia is useful to me. And uh, with the side understanding, I know it's not for everyone. It is okay that it is not for everyone. There may be ways you can find that it's a, you know, that it will work with your interests. And this is kind of partly what me and Molly are kind of here to talk about. So, uh, the things that I do on Wikipedia. And one of the things I love about Wikipedia is every image you find on Wikipedia is free for you to use for whatever the heck you want. So this completely bizarre thing behind me, I don't, can you guys see this whole slide? Cause I can't see my whole slide. Okay, great. Um, it's just some like random joke thing that somebody uh, created. So I did some work with the One Lib One Ref project, which is to help librarians add Invitations to Wikipedia because one of the things that's kind of an outside joke about Wikipedia is the citation needed tag that you see above a lot of pages. 
One Lib, One Ref is kind of an annual project for librarians to like, hey, help Wikipedia be better by adding a citation. One of the things you notice when you work on a project like this is many of the pages, especially biographies, which is my area, that require citations are often women, people of color, women of color, people with disabilities, and other people who are in what we would call underrepresented groups, which on Wikipedia is basically everybody that's not a white dude between 25 and 45, right? So that's great. That's an easy thing to fix. And it's just, it's literally like being a janitor. Additionally, adding public domain images. There's lots of resources where you can find pictures, especially pictures of people, especially pictures of underrepresented people. And black newspapers are amazing for this and I'll let other people talk about that. And adding a picture can help make an article feel real, especially adding a picture of a person. I mean, just, you know, the slide you just saw with the picture of that woman makes you think more about it than just looking at a chart, right? I also help people approve articles. If you're a new person to Wikipedia, you may need to go through a draft process and have some random person on Wikipedia approve your article. Your article is more likely to be approved if it's about an anime character than if it's about a black woman business person in the 1920s. I can help with that. So can many people, but it's worth knowing getting behind that can help you overcome some of the issues. Women in Red, you may know if there's a link on Wikipedia that does not have an article behind it, it'll show up in red typeface. Um, women in Red is all about making women blue, which is getting more articles about women on Wikipedia, the end. Very supportive community, very helpful project. I write little stubs about librarians because more librarians should be on Wikipedia because a lot of what we do on the internet. I help new editors, and this is a big thing I'll just say to everybody out there and you tell your people, I'm accessible and available. If you're having a problem with Wikipedia, not all of them can be fixed, but many of them can, and I would be happy to help you. And one of the things Wikipedia has added in the last, I don't know, five years, is the thank you button. <laughs> Literally, if you're looking at who's made the edits to a page, you can thank somebody for making a good edit. And that's just a little way to pass around slightly better feelings in an area that sometimes people can feel are contentious. So an example that I literally just added 10 minutes ago, Jewel Mazik is a librarian, activist, did a lot of really interesting stuff in and around Washington, D.C. in the 40s and happened to be photographed by the U.S. Government Office of War Information, which later became the WPA. There's photographs of her, a black librarian in the 40s, on the internet. I didn't know anything about her, learned about her, wrote an article. And this is all hand wavy. It takes a little bit of work and time, but wrote this article. And now, if you look for her, on Google, which is exactly what Pete was talking about, you get an info box that makes it seem more like she's a person. Now, I know she's a person, other people know she's a person, but having that sense of authenticity to both the activism work she did, her work at the Library of Congress, and this used to show up with a picture and it doesn't anymore, who knows why, but a picture, helpful, has utility, helps push us closer to where we want to be to having a more inclusive, diverse Wikipedia with more people represented. And so librarians have special skills that they can bring to the table. We can make lists like my list of Vermont towns. We can make resources to help people find things like newspapers, things like people in newspapers, searching within newspapers. We can add citations and fact check. We can give these things our thoughtful and kind attention. And we can manage the fact that while it is an imperfect system, as many of our libraries and basically everything is, there's still things you can do to make those things better. And Wikipedia more than many allows people to do this work. So if I can help you, my contact information is, I'm basically Jessamine everywhere, uh, but there's also like Jessamine the yoga enthusiast. So that's not me, but find me on Twitter, find me on Wikipedia, feel free to send me an email. If I can help, I'd be happy to.
Thank you so much, Jessamine. That was fantastic. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think uh, I'd, I'd maybe just interject here. I think in our list of, uh, of participants in the webinar, I think we have a pretty good mix of people who are experienced Wikipedia editors and, uh, and people who are brand new to it. Uh, so I think your whole presentation there, Jessamine, is a really good cue to, uh, to sort of demonstrating how much, how many different roles there are to play in a campaign like this. So, um, you know, it's, it's incredibly welcome uh, for someone like you to be offering your support. We really appreciate it a great deal. And I'm sure many of our, uh, our participants will, uh, will be glad to have someone else to reach out to. Uh, and I think if there are experienced Wikipedians here, uh, keep in mind there that you might be able to help us by writing an article, but you also might be able to help us by watching the talk page and by helping people out in the kinds of ways that Jessamine described as well. So all of that is sort of the glue that will hold a campaign like this together and really help us be productive. Um, so uh, let's let's hear from Molly. So uh, Molly is a librarian at the Special Collections of the University of Virginia which actually has an extensive collection of local black owned Fantastic. newspapers. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so Molly, why don't you also uh, start off, let, let us know what got you started with Wikipedia to begin with, uh, and then maybe you can show us your presentation. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, you can hear me, I hope. Um, great. So I got started in Wikipedia actually back at my previous job. I used to be a curator at the University of Texas at Austin at the Harry Ransom Center, which is a massive special collections library that houses the archives of a lot of writers. And I started using Wikipedia in order to um, point people to our collections. So uh, we discovered that the that Wikipedia pages were the number one entry point to our archives um, when people were doing research. So if they did a Wikipedia search on John Steinbeck and they found out that there was some stuff at Texas, they'd click that link and they'd end up on our website learning more about the kind of resources we could provide. And this was probably back 2006, 2007 is when I started when you weren't supposed to make any edits to any Wikipedia page you'd had anything to do with. So it was very, it was an interesting time, um, but we managed to find the right ways to do this um, and to make sure that people could find the resources they needed. So that's how I started with Wikipedia. And I started doing a little bit of editing and then I started doing more and more editing. And over the last few years, I just, write articles for fun. Um, I just, I love um, creating a biography of someone that doesn't exist anywhere. And then I like to go check the page views. I just, just makes me happy. So uh, that was, that's my background in, in Wikipedia. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today um, is how I've taken my personal passion for Wikipedia and found that it's become something I can really do interesting things with at work. Um, rather than just on the weekend. So I wanna talk a little bit about an example of how newspapers and Wikipedia can uh, serve um, our knowledge and understanding of underrepresented communities. Um, so, everybody knows Charlottesville uh, was visited by large numbers of white supremacists um, on August 11th and 12th. And, after that happened, just a few days after, I went on Wikipedia to look at the view stats for the Charlottesville page on Wikipedia. And you can see here that they go from, you know, I don't know, maybe a thousand views um, a day up to over a hundred thousand um, on the 13th, the day after those events concluded and Heather Heyer uh, was killed by a man driving through a crowd. And this was really sobering because the Charlottesville Wikipedia page basically didn't say anything about black people. Um, and this entire situation arose because of black people in Charlottesville. A high school student had started a petition to have a Confederate statue removed and that petition is what prompted this rally. Um, and in fact, tomorrow, um, September 12th, 2020, we are having our first Confederate statue taken down in Charlottesville, not the one that that petition was about, but Johnny Reb. 
So race in Charlottesville has been um, a really big deal um, from its beginning. Obviously, this is a town based in slavery, built on slavery, um, but slavery probably wasn't mentioned at all on that Wikipedia page. I could go back and look at the history. I can't remember exactly, but um, I decided to start adding information about Black life in Charlottesville, like adding what happened during, um, like what the population was when, 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 when there were slaves, which was pretty high percentage, what happened during um, Reconstruction and what happened um, during um, the Jim Crow era. And then most importantly, what happened during the era of massive resistance when um, people didn't want to have Black people in school with their children. So rather than send their children to the federally desegregated schools, they sent their children to segregation academies and basically started schools in order to avoid integration. Um, so race in Charlottesville is a huge is issue and underrepresentation in Wikipedia is also a huge issue. So for instance, here are two pages that have been on Wikipedia for a very, very long time. One for Sarah Patton Boyle, an extremely important civil rights activist in Charlottesville, who had sort of a, a, a come to Jesus moment. And she was, she was a Christian and her faith was really an important part of her activism and was mentored by an African-American in town named TJ Sellers. Um, but T.J. Sellers uh, didn't have a Wikipedia page. So Sarah Patton Boyle wouldn't exist without T.J. Sellers. And um, he didn't have a page, even though he's mentioned on her page. And then Lane High School was the white high school in Charlottesville during segregation. And um, it didn't have, um, the black high school didn't have a page. So one of the first things that I did was create pages for T.J. Sellers and the Burley High School. Um, this was a really satisfying project, I was able to find a great deal of information about both of these and various sources online. And I got most of my information on TJ Sellers by using library databases. Um, one of the most valuable resources for anyone editing in Wikipedia, um, especially if you're editing minor figures in the true sense of minor, those haven't been written about by a lot of white people, um, is to use newspaper databases. Um, and I found a lot about Sellers and his career there and was able to make him a page. And um, Sellers was also not just um, an important mentor and civil rights activist in Charlottesville, but he was a newspaper um, editor and publisher in, in Charlottesville. Um, and uh, this turned out to kind of spur my interest in, in adding information about newspapers and thinking of new ways to work with newspapers. Um, I got interested after writing those first couple of articles in, in a sort of more ambitious plan to think about Charlottesville in Wikipedia. And I started creating articles about black schools, black neighborhoods, black change agents, and black newspapers. And then I met Lane Raspberry, who uh, came to UVA to be a Wikipedian in residence. And I went to a presentation he gave for library staff. There were probably about 30 of us there at the presentation to hear what he was going to be doing at UVA. And, and Lane's interest was mostly in, in the Wikidata, Wikidata project, as many of you probably know. But I found myself thinking, there's this person here at UVA whose whole life is Wikipedia. This is amazing. Uh, and over the course of the presentation and discussion, I came up with this idea. I thought, I want to have events. And I want to think about Wikipedia edit-a-thons in a totally different way from how I've seen them represented before. I want to think not about here's a list of articles we need in Wikipedia and let's find the sources to populate them. Cause I think this came up a little bit in the discussion. I thought, well, why are we starting with the subjects of articles and then looking for the sources? I work in a special collections library. My specialty is original artifacts, most of which, many of which are unique and aren't held in many places or any other places at all. And I thought, what if we did a Wikipedia edit-a-thon based not on the goal of creating articles, but the goal on taking um, sources that could become citations and lifting the content from those sources to wherever they might go in Wikipedia. So I decided that what I wanted to do was have an event. So I got Lane to help me. I got a couple of other library colleagues who uh, did a lot of work with students to help me. And we held um, the first surfacing Black Life um, 
in Charlottesville edit a thon. And uh, we did one with library staff to test it out, and it was amazing. We had historical newspapers from Charlottesville. Um, we had local periodicals of various kinds, and we also had school yearbooks. And these are all very important sources. And uh, when it comes to a small town like Charlottesville, and really, well, small city like Charlottesville, and any small city, um, these things are often very, very rare. Um, and we used these sources to populate Wikipedia pages. It was extremely successful and then spurred um, a freshman writing instructor who created a variant of this for her students and then came back the next semester with another first year writing uh, instructor and they did a joint uh, edit-a-thon with their students both based on this principle of starting with sources and then populating Wikipedia from those those sources. It's, it's way more satisfying um, in my experience because you know that you have a, you know you have a source and your citation is, is sitting in front of you. Um, the, the example that I, I'd like to end with is just to show you what one of these sources looks like. This is, um, I, I couldn't get into work this week, so this is my, uh, my UVA box folder containing a um, a, a, a partial run of a newspaper called The Reflector that T.J. Sellers started in Charlottesville in 1933, and it ran probably just through 1935. We don't have a full run, and there is no record anywhere of how long uh, this paper actually ran, because the only record of this newspaper is the newspaper itself, and that copy is held in the library where I work. Um, and it's wonderful. Each issue is just a handful of pages long. And it seems that T.J. Sellers probably wrote almost, almost the entire thing. Um, and from this thing, this wonderful little newspaper, it's incredible what kind of information um, you can get to add to Wikipedia. Um, the history of Black life in Charlottesville is of national significance, if not international significance. And we know that now from what happened here and how it still appears uh, that the events in Charlottesville are the defining touchstone, unfortunately, for um, the political debates in our nation um, right now. In fact, our free speech wall appeared um, um, at the Democratic National Convention, uh, if anyone watched the wonderful roll call, um, Charlottesville was the roll call image, of course, um, because Charlottesville is now um, probably the first place people think of when they think of uh, Virginia in our day and age. And when I first moved here, I had to explain to people that my flight was to Charlottesville, Virginia, not Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, so it's, it's our, the status of this town in the national imagination has really changed. So this uh, newspaper is really magnificent. We have things like an editorial here on the first page about um, race reliance, um, Negro education, and a sort of um, slightly uh, satirical article on, um, on racial advancement and schooling. So real emphasis on education in this particular issue. Also in this issue are really remarkable things like <clears throat> the advertisement for the Apex Beauty Shop. Um, important note being that this is the only beauty shop in town. That's an important fact to know about Charlottesville in 1933. This wasn't the only beauty shop in town, but it was the only beauty shop in town for the primary audience of the reflector, which was the African-American community. So we know from this that there was a beauty shop in town for the African-American community. Things like social notes can give us incredibly important information. For instance, um, I was just peeking through this this morning and looking at the St. Emma Institute, which I'm guessing from this description here was probably a trade school specifically for Blacks. Um, there wasn't a lot of integrated trade education in Virginia in the 1930s. It was very, very segregated. And a quick Google search showed me very little, if almost nothing, about the St. Emma Institute, except a digitized um, uh, 
portion of text from this very article here. Um, what was the St. Emma Institute? What was trade education like in Virginia in the 1930s? Um, a lot of the schools in Charlottesville that could be attended by Blacks were trade schools, and this um, occurs elsewhere in the state. We also learn here that um, there was a, a, a local mortician, a female local mortician named Otelia Abbott. How does Wikipedia cover black, um, the black uh, industry of, of death and uh, funerals, uh, morticians and um, graveyards, so on and so forth. There's a huge amount of interest right now in Charlottesville in recovering or literally uncovering um, black cemeteries. And in fact, um, a number of librarians um, on our staff are going uh, later this month to do work um, on the Evergreen Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia, which is covered with kudzu. And over the last few years, there's been an effort to begin uncovering that cemetery where a lot more Wikipedia data will be found. Um, the Reflector has a Wikipedia page and has had it for some time. It's a pretty bad page. It, it needs to be improved. Um, I could probably do an entire class session just uh, helping students think about how they can improve the Reflector page. But my energy generally has been on using those newspapers to populate other pages. And finally, I'll just end here with a little bit of sort of page view information. Like I said, I love page views. These page views are not necessarily huge. We see just a few people a day um, looking at these pages. But Burley High School, which is the, the third of these pages and one that I created, it looks sometime in the middle of 2018, gets a consistently solid number of views, um, which shows me that it was really, really important to add Burley High School to Wikipedia and to give it um, the space that it deserves. Um, thank you very much for listening to my little story. Uh, I have also put a link to my slides um, in the chat if you'd like to uh, take a longer look at them and take a look at some of those pages. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Molly. That was a fantastic presentation. Thank sure you. Was. So much excellent detail. Yeah, there's uh, some great launching points for all kinds of work that we could do. Um, so I would like to uh, I would like to propose a uh, a brief activity here that we can so we can take a little bit of a break. And I'll, once I've described this, I'll just pause our recording. Um, but I. I thought anyone here who is uh, is new to Wikipedia, it might be a good opportunity to um, to make your first edit, which could just be to our project page, right? You don't have to work on a Wikipedia article, but just to the just add your name to the list of people who are working on this campaign. Um, and uh, and another thing you can do this 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 is assuming that you have an account on Wikipedia. If you don't already have an account. You can still follow these instructions and you can put your name and then later on once we've got you set up with an account you can come back and replace that with an actual link to your account but um, you actually can edit wikipedia without having an account uh, so feel free to follow the these instructions uh, to do that and if you're a more uh, experienced wikipedian you might want to just take a look at our uh, news on wiki page and the links off of there to get a, a sense of how we're structuring this campaign. One of the main things that, so when we come back from this, uh, we're going to have a Q&A session and, uh, and we'll all get a chance to ask uh, some questions of these experts that just presented to us. One of the things I think we might want to focus on is how we should go about building the kinds of lists that will guide our campaign. So lists of newspapers that don't have an article but need one uh, and lists of re reference materials and things like that. So if you're a more experienced Wikipedian, you might look at the news on Wiki page and the links specifically to uh, newspapers from Washington State, black owned newspapers and newspapers of the Caribbean. Uh, we've the, the first of those, the Washington State, that's kind of the most uh, developed of our list pages. And, uh, and hopefully we can think about how to build those out so that they'll uh, be useful to our campaign going on, going forward. So um, with that said, uh, I just want to mention I oh, saw. Yeah. Go ahead. I just want to mention I saw Alita Seals from the uh, New York Black Librarians Caucus. I just wanted to give a shout out. Um, they're a great group, and I saw uh, I think Ayo Yemi uh, has said hello. So thanks for all of you who have been uh, kind of saying hello during this, and welcome. 
Great. Yeah. Well, okay. And and uh, maybe we can do some. Uh, we'll we'll just read down the list of participants when we come back, uh, and hopefully we'll have some questions. So I'm going to set my timer for two minutes. Uh, so why don't you uh, take a look at those two links that I just put in the chat and see if you can do something on Wikipedia, and we'll be right back. Good to see you as well, Alex Dinson from the One Librarian, One Ref project with a program with uh, uh, the Wikimedia Foundation. Welcome as well. Pete, you're on mute. Of course, I muted myself for that. <laughs> All right. Well, so our two minutes are up, and I'm about to restart the recording. Uh, if you're in the middle of um, of something, uh, we'll be able to get back to it afterwards and and help you out later. Uh, so, with that said, I'm going to start it back up, and I've got a question I'm going to start with. If you have a question, please feel free to uh, uh, to use the Q and A feature. Uh, or just put something in the chat and we will we'll approach this pretty informally and hopefully we'll have time to get every, everyone in with any questions you've got. So here we go. Good to see you. So uh, I wanted to ask, I, well, I wanted to present uh, just one of the lists that I was just uh, talking about. So this is, this is the list of, that we have for Washington State. This is mostly a holdover from the last phase of the campaign when we were really working on newspapers all over the country. And um, so what we basically have here is this resources section. We've listed a bunch of different uh, source materials that talk about newspapers of Washington. Uh, they're mostly historic source materials, but that this kind of saves every individual working on it from having to do their own research and find their own books and journal articles that talk about newspapers and where they're online, there are links to them. And then below that, we have a list of newspapers in Washington state that, uh, that we don't yet have Wikipedia articles for. As you can see, some of these are blue links. So these are actually ones that were in our list, but then someone did add an article, or in some cases, they might actually just be a redirect that like goes to the Wikipedia article about that town. So we might actually not have a dedicated article about it yet. Um, but I wanted to just present this uh, and and get, uh, get your reflections, Jessamine and Molly, as far as how does this format look as, as librarians? Does this seem like a, a useful format to you? Do you think that we should kind of follow this as we build lists about black owned newspapers and newspapers of the Caribbean? And do you have any thoughts about how to best populate lists like this? 
I guess I would say that um, I don't know that I would find that as easily as I would a regular Wikipedia page. Um, and I know that there's a good one on uh, black newspapers in Virginia, for instance. Um, so I would probably, if I was starting somewhere, I might go there if I was going in Wikipedia, but I'd probably just go straight to Library of Congress. I guess what I'm, I guess maybe I have a bigger question, which is how do you get people, enough people excited about this kind of project? And so what I'm, to, so that a lot of people would get involved with doing the editing and how are you going to get those people into the collections where they're going to need to physically go in order to look at a lot of these papers since a lot of them aren't included in these major newspaper databases. So how do you get them into places like my special collections where they can ask for these things, sit down at a desk with the physical paper in front of them and their computer right next to them and generate that content. And I would say this seems to me like something that could be presented at like you know the annual conference of media studies um, scholars. Um, what do faculty in media studies know about newspaper history and how they're using it in their instruction? Can you get faculty teaching the history of media to do projects with their classes at newspapers all over the country, at universities all over the country, which are the institutions that are going to house most of these lesser known papers to, um, to undertake these as projects with their students. I think that we've seen at UVA that when faculty realize that they can do a project like this with their students, they get really, really excited because there's nothing better than having students generate real content that's out there for the world that they're responsible for um, and that is actually going to be used. Um, so it seems to me like the bigger question is how do you make this known to academic stakeholders who could then become your team of minions um, yeah. doing doing this really essential work. And I think for, for me to add to that, um, yes, to everything Molly said. Um, and also, I mean, I think there's two really important parts to getting buy-in from people who aren't necessarily your core enthusiasts. Um, one of them is make the creation process as easy as possible, which often can mean, I mean, I like the, the way that your page had like lists, red link lists with like pointers to go almost immediately for more information. Um, I feel like having some drop in templates for a lot of this stuff. I know for a lot of my biographical work, I just have kind of a template frame that I'll drop into a new page and then, you know, I don't have to type the parentheses around the date every time, it's just there. I don't have to type the category, it's just there. Like the extent to which you can build a template that you can say, hey, if you can like drop this in, fill in these nine things that you can get by going to your library or maybe from the Library of Congress, you can have a stub, which is good enough to get started and then you can kind of scaffold on top of that, right? Like this team could create a template, other teams could create the stubs, other teams could build it out. Because the one thing that's worth understanding is even the Library of Congress, our knee plus ultra library, their information about newspapers is just as good as it can be. But man, you'll find some newspapers in there twice. You'll find some newspapers with factual information that doesn't match maybe what you find if you go to your town newspaper. We do the best we can. We include as many citations as we can. And then you kind of move on and don't get kind of stuck in the, you know, La Brea tar pit of, is it 1898 or 1897? And then figure, you know, Wikipedia is self-healing at some level once you've got the basic stuff there. So reducing barriers to entry um, and linking and not reinventing any wheels you don't have to, right? If the information's at Library of Congress, link it. Don't copy it over because that's where you get cruft in your data that ultimately can undermine a long-term project, which I think is what you hope this will be. Yeah, great. And I do just in response to, uh, to Molly's question, uh, we did in the, in the last phase, we had a pretty extensive involvement from a number of uh, university professors and actually teaching and learning staff uh, was a was a pretty um, uh, we had we had several teaching and learning uh, uh, professionals as well uh, and actually I'm going to put a link 
in the chat to this is just a list of some of the articles that we have. So we had there were some blog posts about editathons at Wellesley College and Middlebury College um, that kind of describes some of that. I think as far as if, if it wasn't clear in my the, the page that I was showing, um, the idea of a page like this is more it's it's project coordination, right? So it's it's more as a resource for people who are actively engaged in this process. It's not as a way to draw them in so much as it is a resource for us to use as we're uh, working to build out these articles. So, um, uh, you know, just so basically so that we have a sense so we can track our own progress, right? So that we can see, oh, we've got, you know, 20 articles in this category that we want to write. Well, we've written five of them and which one should I take on next? It's a little, it's, it's more like that. The idea isn't so much that it becomes something that's, that's seen all over the world. And, um, and I'm going to just pull it up briefly again, just so I can point something out. Um, if I can click the right button here. Uh, let's see, I think I went oh, to a different tab. There we go. So, yeah, so so something that you might not be familiar with if you're if you're a bit new to Wikipedia is the concept of a namespace. And for a campaign like ours, this is really pretty crucial. Um, usually, when you look at a Wikipedia article, you will not see this part before the colon. You'll just you'll just see the title of an article. So if we look at you know just any random article on Wikipedia, the title of the page is just the title of the page. This is a Wikipedia article. But um, if you see a colon you know, some text followed by a colon at the beginning of the name, that tells you that you're not actually in the pages of the Wikipedia, you're actually looking kind of behind the scenes. You're looking at a page that's more about how Wikipedia editors work together and coordinate their work. So our page, uh, our pages on News on Wiki, um, they're in the Wikipedia space. Um, and then there are other namespaces as well. So like uh, user colon would be a page uh, that's for like a user profile for, you know, so if I click on my username here, this is my demo account, but this is a page that's about me. This is, again, it's not part of the encyclopedia. It's just a way for people to know who they're, um, who they're working with. Um, so anyway, so I'd like to uh, jump into the chat and catch up on some of the other questions that we've had coming in here. Uh, and Sherry, or uh, if anyone has one that they want to highlight, please feel free to jump in. I'm kind of just catching up. I'm also going to take a look at the, uh, the chat. So if you have something that you want to bring up and maybe are too shy to call it out, you can put it in the chat and I can try and do, uh, point to it as well. So I, I see a, a great comment here from Marilee Prophet, who is a, another longtime Wikipedian librarian. Uh, Marilee, if you'd like, and scholar. Uh, and if you'd like, uh, we could just give you the mic if you'd like to speak for a moment. Uh, I don't see a specific uh, question or comment in there that you, that I I don't know if you want us to repeat it, but we could do it that way as well if if you want. So I'm going to jump in with another question as we as we're okay. Um, so uh, Molly, one thing I wanted to ask you about, and you got into this uh, to some degree in your talk, but maybe you could elaborate a little bit. Is you know you, you you talked a fair amount about the unique holdings that a collection like yours have that you might have the only copies of certain newspapers left in existence, uh, and what a what a crucial uh, thing that is for for just keeping track of our history, and I will. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about, on a practical level, as a Wikipedia editor. Let's say I, as a as a Wikipedia editor in Oregon, am interested in writing an article about uh, a little known black owned newspaper from the 1880s in Virginia. Um, how would I be able to access your collections? Uh, and also, as we kind of discussed a little bit uh, ahead of this. Uh, you know, if 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 that were to prove too difficult, well, what what would I do if I was trying to find something in my own community? Uh, what how does one interface with special collections and actually get access to that information in order to make it more accessible on Wikipedia? Yeah, so every special collections is different. Um, each one has its own policies, and um, so jumping in can be a little intimidating. But if you wanted to um, to do it, you should be able to do it pretty much anywhere. Um, so if you're in Oregon and you contact me and you want to do something on an 1880s Richmond black newspaper, let's say, 
um, look like they doubled from 1880 to 1890 on Sherry's slide in Virginia. Um, you would probably just um, go to our website and find our reference request form and you might just shoot an email and say, hey, I'm interested in knowing if you have digitized versions of this newspaper that I found in your catalog or found on WorldCat or any other source where you might find it. And then you'll hear back from the librarian um, who keeps track of the reference inquiries. It's a very um, one-on-one -on -one experience when you're working in special collections. You're going to hear back from an individual even if you're um, communicating to a, a, a sort of a, a, a blank inbox. Um, and they will inform you probably no, it hasn't been scanned, or if you're lucky, yes it has, and it's up online on a database and you can look at it there. The problem with that being, of course, that unless you are affiliated with an institution of higher learning that has these extremely expensive subscriptions to huge databases of digitized or microfilmed newspapers, you might not have access to that at all. Um, but somebody might actually mail you the microfilm, believe it or not, and then you can look at it at your public library wherever you live. So sometimes that happens. Um, or they might offer to scan it for you. Um, but scanning is very expensive. If you want to order scans, for instance, from University of Virginia to be delivered to you, it's $50 for the first hour of scanning time and $25 an hour after that because it's, it's tough work and slow work and there's a lot of quality checking and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a heavy duty expense to do that and you can only get low resolution images at a very small number a year. You can get 50 images a year from us for free, but that's it. And in fact, right now, we're not even doing that because we need to make sure that we can fulfill the needs of UVA people before we can fulfill anyone else's needs during the pandemic. And so the likelihood of being able to get any of these things in any kind of timely fashion is pretty limited. But, um, but so what I would probably then recommend if these were the circumstances would be find out what there is in your area. And in my opinion, the best way to do that, and I, if I can sh still share screen, I think I can. Uh, let me see if I've got that open. Yeah would be, um, there's a really great, uh, where'd it go? Library of Congress site. Chronicling America. Um, hang on, let me see if I can, let me see if I can get this up here. It's so, the, it's a directory of black newspapers. Hang on a second, let me get myself set up. There's a really great directory of black newspapers. It might be Chronicling America. It's um, directory of U.S. newspapers in American libraries. This was looks like it was an NEH project. Mm -hmm. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you can um, if you scroll down, you can refine your results by ethnicity. So this is pretty great because you can look for any ethnicity of papers that you're interested in. Um, so if I break that down, you can see mm -hmm. how many they are here. Oh, that's interesting. Look at how many Polish newspapers there are, but tons of African-American newspapers. And then you're in Oregon. So we go down to state. Mm -hmm. More states. And we're going to look for Oregon in here. Oh, why isn't it alphabetical? I guess it's by quantity. And then um, what's really, really cool is then you can go to libraries that have it. Excellent. And this is really, really cool. So I am somewhere in Oregon, and let's hope that I'm in, in Bend? Eugene. No. Eugene, right. Let's hope I'm in Eugene because there are 12 that are held in Eugene. And you can see, actually, if we go back to that for a second, there are very few that are held anywhere else. Yep. Um, okay. which tells you a lot about how rare these things are. And then suddenly you're like, wow, I could just take a drive down to Eugene and look at their run of the Clarion Defender from Portland, which ran from 65 to 70 something. That's Great. what I would recommend. Okay. Fabulous so, and let's resource. be sure that this list, that this link is in our, uh, I'll put it in, in the our chat. project pages. Yeah. Okay. And if someone wants to put it in one of the project pages from there, please go to it. Um, I should, so I should I, mention we have about five minutes before the end, just putting a time call. Great. Okay. So there's one there's one topic I wanted to get in here, and maybe Jessamine, you could speak to this. Um, I don't think we really talked much about Wikidata, and Wikidata is uh, is really crucial to our project 
um, the last time around, it was one of the main ways that helped us keep track of our progress. Uh, Wikidata is a sister site to Wikipedia that allows you to keep structured information. So information that's, you know, in terms of like a specific fact about an entity. So where a Wikipedia article might be a bunch of text, a corresponding Wikidata item might say year founded, 1892, you know, name of founder, such and such. So it's, it's, it's linked data in that way. And so where we only have uh, maybe about a, a thousand or a couple thousand US newspapers on Wikipedia, we actually have, you know, seven or 8,000 in Wikidata. Um, so Jessamine, could you maybe give us a, a, a few words about Wikidata and how, uh, how a librarian would look at a resource like that uh, and how it connects with Wikipedia? It's amazing. Um, <laughs> one, Wikidata is, I use it in two ways, really. Like it is just structured data that can underpin Wikipedia articles or that Wikipedia articles can feed into in kind of a hand wavy, I don't have time to explain right now. But it's the reason we know that Mark Twain's and Samuel Clemens are actually underlying the same entity. In librarianship, we call this authority control, and it's why Wikipedia's structure is useful and has utility, whereas other giant archives of stuff that are not run by professionals maybe aren't. And so if you're making an article on a topic, you can literally add like curly bracket, curly bracket, authority control in the footer of your article, and either robots or maybe humans that act like robots, I don't even know, can put those things together. So if you know when someone was born and when they died authoritatively, that can feed Wikidata. But like Women in Red, the project that I work for, generates huge lists of people who are women and other information about them from the vast store of information that is Wikidata that gets information from publicly available places. And what that means is you can get a huge list of people who are women and also not in Wikipedia that you can pick from in order to make Wikipedia's human eyeball readable information better. And so sometimes people may choose to work in the Wikidata space, which you can, or the Wikipedia space, which you can, or the linking space between them, which you can, and all of them are useful in helping, again, just kick the ball down the field of making authoritative information better in Wikipedia and on the internet. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, I, before uh, our last couple of minutes here, I just want to mention that we do have a mailing list. So if you want to join this effort and you haven't joined the mailing list yet, it, uh, the mailing list is in the chat. Um, there's, I think Mary Lee had a question, Pete, about Red List. And, and um, uh, okay, so uh, it looks like she's already been answered. Um, yes, there will be uh, Red Lists. Um, during this project as well. Pete, go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, I think we are at the end of our hour and uh, <clears throat> I really want to thank Molly and Jessamine for joining us and sharing just a, such a sliver of the wealth of knowledge that you have uh, that connects with our effort here. Uh, we really look forward to engaging with you and with all of our guests throughout the campaign. Uh, and my, uh, my thought as we close this up, I'm gonna stop the recording but I think we may have some people here who are able to stick around for a little while and might want to chat a little bit more informally uh, and kind of get connected. So let's leave it open for 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, so with that, thank you everyone. And we look forward to seeing you on the campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks.